Welcome to the Anthropocene, the period in which the Earth and its natural systems are dominated by humanity. Now, if you want a crash course in what the Anthropocene looks like, check this out. The image on the left is how Manhattan looked in 1609 when Henry Hudson sailed up the river that now bears his name. The image on the right is Manhattan today. The Lenape Indians had already lived in this area for hundreds, even thousands of years when Hudson arrived. But in just a few centuries, the island has been remade by human action. It is this remaking of nature by humanity to which the term Anthropocene refers. The term Anthropocene was first used by the ecologist Eugene Sturmer in the 1980s, but came to widespread public attention in 2000 in an article that he co-authored with the Nobel Prize winner Paul Crutzen. A lot has been said about this period, whether it exists as a geological epoch, when it began, what our attitude towards it should be, should we accept it or should we resist it, should we celebrate human dominance or should we back away from it. The fact is, whatever we think about these matters, there is little doubt that I live in a different world than my grandfather. My grandfather, Joseph Edward Smith, was born on December 1st, 1897, into a world of less than two billion people, when the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was more or less what it had been for hundreds of thousands of years. He was a motorman for the streetcar system in Sioux City, Iowa. When he was born, airplanes had not yet been invented, nor had artificial fertilizer. With the development of the Haber-Bosch process in the first decades of the 20th century, humanity took control of the nitrogen cycle from Mother Nature. We were now able to feed vastly more people, fueling a global population explosion that has produced a global population now of more than 7 billion. We have impounded, stored, or otherwise managed most of the fresh water on the planet. And because of the Industrial Revolution, there is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than at any time when humans have walked the Earth. Now, the world that my grandfather was born into was already, by many measures, human-dominated. By weight, the human presence was equal to that of all terrestrial mammals combined. Domesticated animals weighed four times as much as humans and wild terrestrial animals put together. As this slide shows, in the last hundred years, the combined weight of all wild terrestrial mammals has shrunk from 15% of the total weight of all land mammals to about 2%. When you see the tiny fraction of the Earth's biomass now occupied by the elephants, the tigers, the lions, the rhinoceros, this alone tells us much about the human domination of nature. There were no computers in my grandfather's world, nor were there artificial organs. The human genome had not been mapped. Drugs that we take for granted, such as antibiotics, had not yet been invented. 
we are not only remaking the nature that is outside of us, we are also remaking the nature that is within us. We are changing the very idea of what it is to be human. The bionic man was once just a character on a television program in my youth. Now he is an aspiration that is almost within reach. The human domination of nature will have many consequences for the future. Today, I want to discuss one of the most profound, yet least discussed, of these consequences. I want to ask, what will become of love in the Anthropocene? Now, why talk about love? Because we are in Rome. <laughs> and because almost everywhere, whoever we are, love is what we care most deeply about. Whether it is love of country, love of family, love of nature, love of some political or religious ideal, or the feelings we have for another person. What it is to love a husband, wife, or child has had different meanings in different times and places. Yet, love itself has survived. Love requires constancy in so many ways. Perhaps the most obvious is that what we love must persist through time. The persistence of a person has to do with their special features and distinctive characteristics. Places are identified by their sights, by their smells, by sounds. This can involve iconic buildings like the Colosseum, or the spirit of a people in its way of life, la dolce vita. But often, what matters most is flora and fauna. What would Rome be like without its umbrella pines, memorialized in the music of Respighi? Now, I grew up in Southern California. The dominant sights and smells were of the sea. But the flora was important as well. Torrey Pines, where I often surfed and swam, has its own endemic pine tree. And mixed with the salt smell of the ocean is the ubiquitous smell of the eucalyptus. The bowls that are now circulating among you carry this scent. Imagine this smell mixed with salt and carried by the ocean breeze. The eucalyptus is an alien species in Southern California, yet it is as essential to Torrey Pines as, the, as it's an endemic pine and the smell of the sea. The ocean will acidify and change, but it's not going anywhere. The Torrey Pine, on the other hand, will become locally extinct because of climate change. And the eucalyptus, is under threat from insect infestations, fire control regulation, and growing antipathy towards exotic species. Now, there are a lot of fascinating questions here, but what I want to ask is this. What will it mean to love Torrey Pines when its distinctive smells and flora are no longer present? We have already lost to drought and development most of the pools that once formed on the mesas above the sea after a rain. They once hosted a variety of endemic species, including the San Diego fairy shrimp. 
once we lose the Torrey Pine and the eucalyptus, I may still feel as though I have some connection to this place. But what connection? What place? The fundamental question I am asking is this. Will there be anything left to love in the Anthropocene besides ourselves, our creations, and our fantasies? Now, who can think of something they love because their parents loved it? The love of this thing, whatever it is, is entwined in a golden braid with the love you have for your parents. For my co-author, Bonnie Nadzem, the object of love is fly fishing. Fly fishing on the streams of the Rocky Mountains is the object of love that ties her to her parents, to her father in particular. Fly fishing is a difficult skill, even in art, that requires a canny knowledge of nature, the behavior of the fish, the conditions of the water. But imagine fly fishing in the Anthropocene. The fish are bred to be caught, the river has been improved, so now it is risk-free due to liability concerns. A park ranger is available to help you with anything that's difficult or complicated. Success is ensured. Fly fishing may persist in the Anthropocene, but in an atavistic way. Does Bonnie share the experience with her father that he had with his own father? Can she love what he loved in such a world? What about her children and their relation to their past? And what about your children and grandchildren? What becomes of this golden braid? Now, change is inevitable, you might say. Yes, but I'm saying something more. Just as the press of humanity and its technology threatens the wild places of the earth and the distinctive form of experiences that they have given rise to, so this may also threaten the existence of love itself. The necessities of work, reproduction, and leisure will go on. But love and its connections to the past may cease to exist. Love itself may be a casualty of the Anthropocene, at least in the forms in which we may be able to recognize it. Now, if you find this a sad and mournful thought, there is something you can do. This will involve work, because love is like a muscle that is strengthened by the challenges that it faces each day. Love in the Anthropocene will also require action in order to keep our values, rather than the onward rush of things, in control of our lives. For many of us, this will require changing ourselves from being spectators on a planet that, that is out of control to embracing our own agency and responsibility. Change is not easy. It comes not only in thunderclaps and loud voices, but in the quiet stirrings of the heart that we must encourage in ourselves. And, and in others. For love will be as important in the Anthropocene as potable water. And perhaps it will also be as difficult and fragile.
to preserve and to protect. Thank you.